so um, thanks for um, spending the next hour or so uh, with me and having a shorter lunch. Um, I'm Hadrian. Um, I've been involved in the uh, integration space for more than 20 years. I'm a committer on a few projects at the Apache Software Foundation, ActiveMQ, Camel being some of them, Brooklyn, Oath, others, Tinkerpop. Um, I'm a member of the foundation and until recently I was the VP for fundraising as well, so I'm involved in the foundation as well, not just the projects. Um, I've been doing open source for more than 15 years, so if you have any questions for me, you know how to find me. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about the project we started uh, in the messaging space. It started about two years ago. And the messaging space got very commoditized. Most of the messaging products were built between 2000 2005 when you got uh, MSMQ from Microsoft, you got uh, IBM and Oracle with their, uh, well, it was BA, I think, at the time that started it, um, with their uh, ESBs and messaging solutions. And it got commoditized pretty fast. I'm going to talk more about it. So uh, the question was, what can you innovate now? in you know, 2015 at the time in the uh, messaging space. And we were looking at, obviously the thing you look at is scalability, right? So most of the projects were scaling uh, up actually, and you had, had projects like Kafka and uh, um, RabbitMQ that's written in Erlang, right? They were trying to do, to use resources better, to be faster. Actually, even ActiveMQ had a sub-project called Apollo uh, that was much faster than the uh, ActiveMQ core a few years ago. So a lot of people focused on scaling uh, up. And we thought there are some opportunities to scale uh, out, meaning putting uh, more brokers and serving more, more traffic by um, uh, basically producing your broker uh, configuration at scale. And when I say scaling uh, out, I don't really mean just having more brokers because that's a feature that ActiveMQ supports for, I don't know, more than five years. It's called uh, uh, Network of Brokers. What I mean mostly is supporting a large number of applications, messaging applications running in the same brokers. Um, I should have started by asking how many of you are at least intermediate with messaging systems and ActiveMQ? Oh, so that, that's awesome. And uh, this presentation was meant to be less technical, although we can make it technical if you have questions, and to be more um, sharing our experience seeing many messaging deployments of what things work and what, what works less and what you have to do in order to have a scalable and robust messaging system. Um, so uh, I was thinking if you have questions, I, because it's not a large audience, we can probably address them while you have them. I don't know. We're going to see how it goes. So. That's how the journey began. And we thought that if you have a messaging system, what things really customers look at in production or you know, massive users look at? And the first one is security. And ActiveMQ already had good security characteristics, so there was not a lot to innovate there. The question was how you use it, because uh, ActiveMQ, like many other projects at Apache, are both a framework and a product. People see the, the brokers in ActiveMQ, for instance, and they take them the way they are, not realizing that actually a lot of things underneath can be rearranged in different ways, uh, the elements of the framework, to obtain brokers with different characteristics. So, and that's something I wanted to, to show you today as well. So, in the security uh, area, we actually had to constrain ActiveMQ because ActiveMQ allows uh, for uh, anonymous connections and we want it to be secure, so we, we only support uh, uh, authenticated connections. So we enforce having uh, a username and a password, which is what JMS requires for authentication. Uh, and then the other thing, this is probably the most interesting thing we did, is the multi-tenancy. 
uh, which no um, MQ system that's enterprise class does today. Sorry about that. Including the commercial ones. So I'm going to talk more about multi-tenancy because that's what, what we did. So for, for those of you who know ActiveMQ, which is most, uh, most of you, what happens if you have two different messaging apps written by two different groups and they send messages to the same queue and use the same broker? Basically, messages can cross from one consumer of an app to another consumer of another app, right? So what do you do then? Um, you basically have two options. One is to make the two groups who build the messaging applications to talk to each other to make sure that the names don't clash, right? But that doesn't scale because if you write four, five, 10, 20 applications, the uh, risk for mistakes is growing. And the other thing that is quite common, which is even more costly, is to deploy different brokers for different messaging apps. And that becomes sort of a maintenance uh, operational nightmare, right? So what we said, is there, uh, something we can do to have the same network of brokers support multiple messaging applications and not really care that they are sending messages to the same queue and be able to, par able to partition somehow so that the messages don't clash. Is that clear what I'm saying? Should be, okay. Um, another thing was scalability. We wanted to be able to add more brokers as there is more traffic, and we're gonna talk more about that. And then something around governance, and we did something interesting over there as well. Um, then we said, actually, we don't need to use ActiveMQ, we can use whatever. So we looked at ActiveMQ competitors. Some of them are from uh, Apache itself. One is uh, Kafka, which is very popular for uh, streaming. It's very fast. Cupid. Um, RabbitMQ started at uh, uh, Spring Source. I think it's at Pivotal right now. Uh, then there is DDF, which is used mostly in the government space. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. It's also a, a distribution, kind of like service mix, based on ActiveMQ, CXF, Caraf, and uh, uh, ActiveMQ. Then there are some older ones that you may not be aware of anymore. WSO2, they were popular in the federal space a while ago, came out of uh, IBM actually, some people from IBM, Zero MQ. There are the commercial ones, but because of licensing, we didn't even care about those. And all of these don't have multi-tenancy characteristics. The new ones, the cloud services, do have some sort of multi-tenancy characteristics, but they are only running in a specific cloud. They have proprietary APIs, which provide some lock-in. So again, not, not really a good fit, plus it wasn't really what we wanted to do. I didn't uh, mention the uh, Google uh, Cloud PubSub. That's another important thing there. They are doing some really cool stuff as well. So in order to figure out what we want to do, we actually went back to uh, the SOA principles. And back in the early 2000s, people were talking about SOA like people talk about mic uh, microservices today, right? It meant whatever people wanted to, to mean. And only around 2009 or so, of, or so, some people came up with the SOA manifesto where they tried to focus the definition of, uh, of SOA around the uh, business value and the agility and uh, coping with change. And that's something that appealed very much to me because in, the, in my experience, um, I keep saying this a lot, I, code that is not in production is like one of these cruise, cruise ships here staying at the dock all the time, right? It's occupying real estate, it's not useful, it's more a liability than an asset or planes at the terminal, right? So every business has an incentive to move the code they produce as quickly as possible in production to produce value and make money or uh, help providing feedback for running the business or whatnot. So that part of SOA appealed uh, very much to us, so we, we used that part. And you're probably very aware, aware I'm gonna uh, go quickly over this stuff about the uh, core SOA uh, concepts like loose coupling and ser service contracts basically APIs lately, composition. Camel is great in that area, by the way. And we wanted to look more at connectivity, which is uh, 
one important part of SOA and the ESBs and all that stuff that are still in use. Talking about connectivity, there are uh, two styles of connectivity, basically. Um, is the classic Bob talks to Ellie scenario. And you have the choice of synchronous uh, communication or asynchronous communication. Synchronous doesn't scale very well. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. People are shaking heads here. We can talk about that. But um, asynchronous messages, uh, when you send bulk messages, they scale much better. And we can you know, take all sorts of examples, even from the real life uh, sending uh, regular mail, snail mail. Uh, the problem with uh, the asynchronous messaging is that it's not very interactive, right? But it scales much better. So normally, uh, any company or any organization is going to use both. And it's going to use them for, what they, what, for the benefits they provide in a specific context. So our focus is more around the asynchronous um, communication and we had to choose some way to deploy that so we looked uh, at service mix which is the uh, Apache PSB basically um, I'm gonna you probably know about it what it, it it's basically a combination of a Caraf container an OSGI container uh, ActiveMQ for asynchronous communication uh, CXF for synchronous communication the stack and camo provides a mediation, routing, EIP-based sort of framework. Um, why we use OSGI? For a few reasons, a very robust platform. Uh, the security part, we got a lot out of the box. It was very uh, appealing to us. The provisioning part, the logging, even management, the dynamic configuration. So we, we thought it's, um, it provides a lot of the features we really needed. And even for ESB distros, based on the uh, page service mix, there are quite a few. Talent has one that's quite popular. I mentioned EDF before, used mostly in the uh, um, governance space in the US. And uh, Red Hat also has a very popular distribution. I think it's not called JBoss Fuse, but Fabric or Fabricate, something like that. Red Hat people here in the audience will know better. But anyway, Red Hat has a distribution. There are some older ESBs that probably nobody cares about, but anyway, they are open source as well. And you can do it yourself, uh, which is kind of what we did, um, by assembling the same projects I mentioned before. Um, so that brings us to ActiveMQ, which is really the workhorse of the uh, messaging platform. And ActiveMQ has a bunch of uh, features that are very useful. It's based on uh, a JMS 1.1. Um, it's been mature and robust for at least five, six years right now. Uh, I think it's the mostly used in production open source messaging, messaging platform. Um, it has all sorts of goodies for, you know, even streaming, governance, stuff like that. F on the availability side, I mentioned the uh, support for multiple topologies. And that's something we really uh, paid close attention to. Um, everything is pluggable, persistence is pluggable, uh, the transports are pluggable. So when transports became popular, ActiveMQ adopted them. Uh, ANQP is one of them, MQTT is even newer. Uh, there is also a stomp that's not mentioned here, so you can use that from your JavaScript apps in the browser. Um, so anyway, um, a lot of good features in ActiveMQ. Another interesting thing for ActiveMQ is the fact that even though it's written in Java, it has client bindings in a lot of other languages. So you can have a, a JMS broker that's ActiveMQ, but your application could be written in Python, could be in .NET, could be in C++. Uh, JVM-based languages, of course. I mentioned JavaScript in the browser and so forth. So that was a really cool uh, uh, reason, basically, to use um, ActiveMQ. And then I mentioned the topologies. So when you have a broker, no matter what, it's not going to scale infinitely, right? So you're going to have at some your, your traffic at some point is going to exceed the capacity of your broker. So 
you're going to have to put multiple brokers for different reasons, be it for resiliency, if you want something like a master slave or some other configuration, or just the fact that the traffic is, you know, too high and you have to put other brokers. And the, in the way you configure your broker, basically, you can achieve one of these quite popular and known topologies from the uh, uh, fully connected mesh or hyper uh, cube hub and spoke was very popular um, and they all have advantages and disadvantages so don't believe that one is better than the other uh, i saw some um, users large system in production who actually measure before they make decisions on how to adapt their technology that's very smart um, so anyway i encourage you, you if you use active mq to kind of do the same take a look at uh, different topologies and decide what works for you but the fact that you are able to build different topologies what was something that was really good for us so we decided to go down this path and this being the introduction before but before i continue i want to show you a bit of a demo and show you what we did unfortunately the uh, resolution is not gonna cooperate very much we have very low resolution and that uncovered a few bugs with uh, the GUI, but anyway, oops, that's not going to work because I had to exit this thing. So I mentioned multi-tenancy. And one thing we did was, OK, if you have a large number of applications, who's going to own them? What's going to happen there? So we said, um, let's use uh, um, ownership identity management model that's similar uh, to the one used by cloud uh, native applications today. So as an example, let's say GitHub, right, where you have a bunch of users over there. My mouse is sliding that may belong to different organizations and uh, users and organizations can own resources which in github's case are repositories in our case they are messaging applications and um, we came up with this gui in which you can organize your i mean a user get accounts they create organizations they add other people's organization they create projects and all that kind of stuff and we came up with this uh, organization that you cannot really see because it's on this side. This is going to be a bit of a nuisance. I'm really sorry. Hmm. So somewhere here, we should see that the Galactic Empire is our current organization, and I'm logged in as the Chancellor Palpatine, which is a fictitious sort of user. And I have two messaging apps called Tex Aurora and Death Star. And I can go and take a look at these projects and get some metrics and stuff like that. I'm going to show you that in a second. But I also save, have a set of credentials I'm going to talk about a little bit. So in the Tex Aurora case, Uh, nothing has been sent recently. There, there were some messages early on, and we can look at the uh, other stats down there, and you're going to see that there was some traffic over here. And if I look at the credential list, uh, there are some credentials over here. I think this one is the one we look at, the AX something, and the one starting with the capital C. I can actually create new credentials. Um, <coughs> Call it what? Um, um, to Miami. And I can create a credential. This is going to be just a description. It's not the name of the credential. Uh, and it's going to create a new credential. And this is going to be the username and the password. And I can uh, copy to the clipboard. Once I close this window, uh, that username at the top is going to be preserved, but the password is gone. We don't keep it because we don't want to be hacked. We care about security and stuff like that. It's up to the user 
to keep this password. And these credentials are going to be used in the JMS app as the connection credentials to authenticate with the brokers. Does it make sense? But we don't keep them. We keep a SHA. I, I mean, that we have a SHA and the brokers can uh, verify that the credentials are OK, but we don't really keep the password. So once I do this, I'm going to have to, oops, not the browser. Keep the credential here. So I saved it. This is the credential I, I had before. And now what I'm going to do, just a second, let's see if there is a. So I'm going to send here uh, 100 messages with this credential. Uh, the queue is going to be, I think, Miami, hello Miami, or something like that. I can show you where it's coming from. And I'm just going to send these messages. Assuming the network works. And I'm also going to receive, but let's not receive 100. Let's receive only 70 messages, or whatever the number. And let's use the credential I just used. Oops, let, let's take the whole thing. So this is going to start consuming stuff, and you're going to see that stuff over there doesn't really matter that much. What happens, though, if I look here back in Pax Aurora, is the network cooperating? Or? We see that there were 173 messages, I don't know, 170 we received, I don't know where the three others are from, and we can see over, then over here, we, we can zoom in, we can do stuff, analyze, whatever, makes sense, right? So if I look at the traffic, I can see the traffic per, uh, per credential. This is what the one that we used to, to send, active credentials one. Oh, uh, here we got. 103 just in this time window, right? Looks like I'm going away from the microphone. Sorry about that. So I'm not sure if I'm not running out of time. So if I use uh, another credential basically from uh, the Death Star project, you're going to see that I'm going to use the same queue, but it's going to go to the other project because we wrote some extra plugins for ActiveMQ that are not in the ActiveMQ distribution that do some namespacing. So based on the credential, it, ActiveMQ has a plugin that knows what project this credential belongs to and creates some sort of a namespace for the queues in that namespace. So because you use different credentials, but with the same queue name, is going to that cube in that namespace. So does it make sense? And here, actually, we ha I have a small client. It's actually the same client that did run some <coughs> traffic um, today. <coughs> There are some 58,000 messages in the past hour. And if you want to look in the past, I don't know, three hours or six hours, it's about one 
million and a quarter just one client sent messages in the past four or five hours okay um, I think I'm running out of time because I want to leave some room for questions so I'm gonna go back to, to the slides but I think you got the idea so Again, what we worked on is achieving this multi-tenancy that you kind of saw. Uh, the global governance, is there something odd that anybody noticed in the GUI? Nothing? There was no broker. We didn't talk about the broker at all. You don't know how many brokers are there, and as a user, you don't care. You only care about your messaging app, how messages you sent, how many messages you received. There is also a a REST API that can give you some metrics. So all the administration of the messaging system is left to somebody else that you don't care about, right? You only want to see your messages. Another thing that doesn't exist in uh, ActiveMQ and all the other uh, messaging product, products you, you've seen before, we can show stats how many messages were sent and received per credential. So it is a good practice, for instance, to give different credentials to different apps. Uh, there, I didn't show you, but you can also uh, revoke credentials. There is kind of obvious, right? So if you don't like something, you can revoke just that credential. Or if you see that somebody is doing something odd, you can reroute traffic to, through some other broker so you can uh, investigate what's going on. But from a user point of view, from a user of the messaging system point of view, kind of like SQS and the other cloud services, you don't really know how it's operated, how many brokers they are, where are distributed, and so forth. So we took the same approach. Uh, there is a destination sharing feature that we started to implement a few months back that's very interesting as well, that is not present in all these uh, uh, messaging services, including the uh, cloud ones, including things like SQS. We wanted to see, can I actually publish my message stream outside my application? I want other applications to be able to receive my messages, but I don't want to manage the credentials for them. I don't want to give them credentials and for them to ask me to revoke them and all that kind of stuff, and I don't want to give them access to my project either, right? Create an, add, add them to my organization, for instance. So what we added is a feature to basically share a destination, kind of the way you share pictures uh, in, I don't know, whatever application you use, and then they can be shared publicly with everybody. Let's say you, I have a very neat weather application, I want to share my uh, weather events and I publish them to my destination, but then I share the destination to, you know, with other people publicly. Or I can share them with a particular tenant or a particular application. And uh, other people basically say that if I can me get messages in this destination that I can uh, process them, right? So there is a configuration uh, aspect now in the broker to adapt the two and say that this guy shared this destination and this other guy subscribed to this shared destination. So that's, why you, that's how you allow them to manage their own applications, but inside the broker, you can imagine a simple camel route, for instance, although there's no other way we do it, to adapt between the two applications. Does it make sense? That, that we thought was pretty neat. Um, for identity management, we basically talked about the model, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, for the broker topology, this is an interesting uh, thing. So once we started to look at it, we realized that actually, um, I think all of the messaging deployments I've seen, with one exception, and that was a small exception, all the topologies were homogenous, meaning that all the brokers looked alike. Even if it's a master slave, they, are, they look the same way, it's just that when the master died, the slave becomes the broker, but it's essentially the same thing, right? But it doesn't need to be the case. It, it's not, there's nothing in ActiveMQ that says that all brokers have to be alike. So in our top, we came up with a heterogeneous topology in which some of the brokers uh, don't carry uh, client traffic, if you want, they have other roles in the messaging system. For instance, we have this master uh, broker that 
receives all the advisories from the other brokers. Uh, do you know how advisories work? No? So in a network of brokers, uh, when you have multiple brokers and a client connects over here and the, uh, the producer and the consumer connects over there, how do they know the brokers to send the messages from here, there, because that's where the consumer is? So what happens is every time there is an event inside the broker, like a connection gets created, a producer or a consumer gets created, a destination gets used, stuff like that, they send messages to each other, which are called advisories. So then brokers know, aha, I don't know exactly who's listening to, to it, but I know that this broker that's connected to me wants that information, right? Because the advisory was propagated down through that topology links that you saw in the other slide. It's a bit complicated, but anyway, we said that this is too chatty. Uh, just this we can talk about hours about, about. We said, let's not do that. Let's have just one broker that receives all the advisories and creates a graph. We use the Apache Tinkerpop for that, which is a gra graph database, and it's the basis for uh, IBM Graph, for instance, and Neo4j uses it. So we said, let's, let's use all these advisories to create a map, a graph of everything that's going on in the messaging system, all the brokers that are there, the connections that are attached to them, what credentials they are used, and stuff like that. And based on this graph, make decisions, reason how, how to optimize our messaging uh, um, service, okay? Then we got the, what we call the gateway brokers because they are the gateways to the messaging system. These are the brokers that receive uh, messages or exchange messages with clients. Uh, the first thing they do, obviously, they take responsibility for, uh, responsibility for the message, so they are uh, persistent. That's hence the database thing there, or the persistent store. But if you have brokers coming up and down all the time, then what kind of URL are you going to give your, your clients? Right, because your broker can come up and down, and you don't, don't know if he's there, right? You have to have something that's kind of stable there that is used for the client to make a connection. And these are what we call the discovery brokers or D-brokers, we use letters for, for them, which are brokers that are advertised in the DNS. They do not carry any uh, traffic, but these are the brokers clients connect to. They authenticate. Based on the authentication, they use credentials, right? Uh, the master brokers ask the, uh, the discovery brokers have the ma ask the master broker, where should I route this guy? And right away, they force the connection to fail over to one of the uh, gateway brokers that thing is assigned to. Is it crazy? Too complicated? No? Then you have the producer and consumers. And we, we also have worker brokers, things that, let's say you want to do uh, in-flight message validation or stuff like that, which is not really uh, messaging, but value-added processing, if you want, down the messaging chain. For instance, uh, me as an application, I'm subscribing to a stream, but I don't want to get all the stream. I don't really care about it. I only want about some subset of it uh, based on a filter that I can define. I want that filter to run in the messaging system and me only get the messages I care about, not get everything and do that filtering myself. Plus, you can use this kind of uh, feature for uh, transitioning from a version to another and the depth uh, things in the messaging uh, uh, fabric, stuff like that. So these are different kind of brokers. So as you can see, by leveraging the fact that you can have br brokers with whatever um, capabilities you want, you can have a heterogeneous um, topology that I think serves uh, you better. Uh, then for the governance, I, uh, <laughs> I mentioned that already. So we don't really talk about uh, the brokers from a user point of view. We talk about the uh, uh, messaging app and how many messages are in flight, how many were sent, received. Another thing I think I started to mention, I don't think I finished, uh, we don't use JMS because JMS is kind of limited and it's also slow at scale. Uh, we basically import everything, the metrics in Elasticsearch and we have uh, um, indexes and we have uh, an API that basically make queries on it and that's how um, 
that's what we use for our metrics. So our governance, our, our management is done by a combination of the data in the graph uh, database in Tinkerpop and um, Elasticsearch, basically. Um, for administration, there is a different view. These are the guys who are in operations, and they look at, uh, at the graph. They see the brokers, as I said. This is, so we're working on the rendering part. That's why you don't see the real thing right now. We did export the graph from Tinkerpop, but we use a tool called Jeffy, which is a uh, uh, standalone tool to visualize it and, and present it this way. So it's not very pretty. We're still working on it. Um, but again, what's important to note is that uh, like SOA kind of expects us to have separation of concerns, administrators have a different view. And they don't really care about how many apps are there and whatnot. They only care about the clients that are connected, right? Um, it's an adaptive topology. So w once we got the ability to deploy brokers on demand and remove them on demand, which we thought is pretty cool, we said, then why do you have to have long running brokers? Pretty much all the deployments are, I, I saw have long-running brokers. I, th those of you who use Active MQ is not the same, the, the same case. You have brokers running for days and months and whatnot. So we said that if we can have so many brokers, then why not have a broker run every, f I mean, for only eight hours, and then it goes away. And interestingly enough, that became sort of a security uh, sort of advantage in the sense that if one gets compromised, who cares because it goes away in eight hours regardless, right? Um, I think I'm forgetting a lot of stuff that are cool about this topology. Um, the layers, so we also realized, okay, to do all this kind of stuff, we need a lot of other services. We needed, uh, first of all, the machines to, to run on. We run, we have, I think, 11 bare metal big servers in Germany and a few in the US. Um, so we have this infrastructure uh, as a service and then we needed some tools to automate the deployment. We used Ansible, now we use Rancher. So I mentioned uh, uh, service mix. We have our own distro like service mix, which is the container in which Caraf runs. But actually what we do afterwards, and I'm gonna show you in the next slide, we uh, re, uh, package it into a Caraf container that we deploy, and actually what gets deployed is the Caraf container that's, o sorry, a Docker container uh, that's already has the Caraf running inside, configured, and that gets deployed on one of the, the machines that are running, bare metal machines that are running uh, Docker. So we use, as I said, Ansible, Docker, Rancher, and we have some other tools. That's for the platform as a service layer. And then we have a number of services. We mentioned, for instance, the fact that we need to manage the, the credentials. So we have LDAP servers. Um, we have Elasticsearch, as I said. We have, um, um, we use Greylog, uh, databases. We have the GUI. We have quite a few other systems, kind of like an infrastructure on, this, on which this messaging uh, fabric uh, works or relies on. Uh, also, in order to deploy things fast, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, everything that's not in production is actually uh, a waste uh, or a liability. We have multiple environments, uh, development, uh, staging, and production. Everything gets versioned, uh, including the configuration. So you, in theory, you're ab able to come and figure out how the um, messaging system looked at the particular uh, moment in time. Uh, things get built, they end up in Archiva. We don't use Nexus because we like Apache, right? Uh, we have Jenkins that does that. You could use GitLab or, or other tools for a continuous delivery pipeline. Things go in, archiv in uh, Archiva. From there, as I said, they get repackaged into uh, uh, Docker containers. We have uh, Docker registry, kind of like Docker Hub, but it's, uh, we host it, in which you put the Docker containers. Ranchers, uh, Rancher has catalog sees them from there. We can update uh, them from there and so forth. Uh, we first deploy them in our development environment to test. Hmm. Then 
if everything works okay, we deploy them in a staging environment where more tests come in, and then it goes in production. Obviously, there are things that go just in production, which is just configuration for adapting the uh, um, structure of the messaging system. Uh, so that's what it ended up being. Um, and in conclusion, what's in the name? Uh, to have a robust uh, messaging system is not just the product or the tool or the project that does the messaging, ActiveMQ in this case. In order to deploy something robust, you have to look at a lot of other uh, aspects and you end up building uh, something more complex that looks like the stuff we built. Um, the social implications of this are that you as engineers, integration engineers, uh, should be familiar with a number of other projects and know how to use them to your advantage and hopefully even contribute to them because, hey, we are Apache. Um, so that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, and I wanted to leave some room for, uh, for questions. I assume there are going to be quite a few. But if not, you can, you know, have a coffee break. So thank you very much. Either you got everything or, yes. So uh, how should the brokers scale? Uh, do they respond to the load or, or do you need um, the, the workers? The, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what the definition of broker scaling is. It's not really the brokers that scale. It's the number of brokers that grows or shrinks. And basically, uh, if you know the one thing I didn't mention. So you use ActiveMQ, you know the XBin configuration, right? The XML configuration. And everybody has a file that is in some location with that configuration. Who knows that there is a, uh, I think, runtime configuration plugin it's called. It's in ActiveMQ for at least five years that allows you that once you change that file, it sees the new timestamp and reconfigures the broker, to, uh, broker at runtime. Who knew about that? Okay. I presented on that last year, by the way. Uh, so basically, you can reconfigure a broker at runtime. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second one is that you know the failover that allows you to move a client. Or there is also a plugin for rebalancing clients as well. So the uh, element that makes two brokers con uh, configure, uh, work to, with each other or connect to each other is the network configuration, right? So you can change the configuration at runtime or redeploy the broker with a different configuration of that network connectors. Does it make sense? So that's how you can adapt the topology at runtime. Make sense? Another thing that I'm not sure you knew is that, that X being, which usually people don't put, just the file, but technically the URL, it's X being colon that thing, that expects a URL to come after, uh, after that, which is, again, usually a file. But it could be HTTP. So what we use, all these configurations are not stored as file locally with the broker. They are served via an HTTP server from one single lo location, and it gets generated from data in that graph. So the configuration of the broker looks for us X being colon HTTP, our configuration service, and then is the name of the broker in there they know how to look at based on a convention. Did I answer? You had the question too. Oh, oh, oh. It, it, yes, I, I can. It's a funny name. Um, so we had to call it something because ActiveMQ is. Uh, an Apache brand, and this started pretty much like as a demo, and we had to give it a name, and we thought, what? Well, it's a messaging fabric, and we thought it's elegant and it's smooth and it's whatever, uh, whatever, and it ended up uh, being SilkMQ. Uh, so we talked. We want to donate most of the code because it was built as open source to Service Mix. We already talked to them, and I think it's gonna happen soon. Um, at one presentation when I had this kind of demo, people also said that it looks kind of expensive, you know, silk. I say, yeah, maybe, I don't know. So, so it's, it's just a name. 
it's, it is active and actually this is just a set of plugins that work with ActiveMQ. It can be deployed with the Talon DSB, with uh, the Red Hat thing, with DDF, with um, Savoir Tech has a thing called Atos, I think, or something like that. Because it's just basically a number of ActiveMQ plugins that are based on some conventions and some uh, other services like LDAP and stuff like that, which you have to wire in. Uh, which also makes it a bit complicated to test in an open source project because you rely on this infrastructure to exist. Well, that's, that's, that's so, yes. You could use Kafka. Actually, I talked to uh, Jay Krebs a couple of weeks back. Kafka's not JMS, first of all. Kafka doesn't support transactions. Kafka's very fast. So there are advantages and disadvantages. However, so you cannot use Kafka. So uh, JMS has two <coughs> domains, right? The point to point, the queues, and uh, the pub sub, the topics, right? So. Pa uh, topics don't have, or PubSub doesn't have transactions, so you could use Kafka for that. But remember, what you see over here, you don't really care what's underneath. So when you connect to the messaging fabric, maybe some messages are gonna go over Kafka. How do you know? Maybe they go over Tuxedo, maybe who knows? Maybe they go over Tuxedo at some point, hitting a legacy app and you get responses and you think it's a new, really cool uh, app. Do you see what I'm, and that's the point of the messaging app or messaging fabric, to adapt uh, different messaging systems. I just talked to Kleber before this thing. So uh, Red had just announced an AMQ that has a different take on the same uh, problem uh, by combining their uh, uh, messaging services. Maybe he's, he's gonna talk more about that after me. Um, but I'm not sure if I answered your question or good enough. Oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, you can use it too. I mean, you can steal from it as much as you want. Any other questions? Yes, no? This is an interesting question. So once we realized what we did, which kind of shocked me to be honest, with the uh, sharing and subscribing, then I realized that actually it's not that if the guy shared and the guy subscribe, su subscribed, I can put, I can do a pass through of the message stream from here there. I actually can put a business process in the middle. I can put a camel route, I can do whatever stuff. Who's gonna do that? How do you attach it to that? Okay, you can use the same model to create some sort of a marketplace. Yeah, so doing. people create their own uh, business processes or camel routes or whatnot, and people would say, when I'm subscribing yeah, to this yeah. destination, I don't want you to just send to okay. my internal destination. I want you to first apply a business process and then do that. So there, there are a number of things you can start doing yeah. with it right now that we realize are possible that are not really possible with ActiveMQ out of the box. So it's fun. Who knows where this is going to go? If you're going to see my presentations for the next two years, because this is really fun, you kind of know what to expect. So that's boring. I saw it before. I'm not going to go. Um, also, uh, how does Artemis fit into this? Because a lot of work. Uh, Ask clever. <laughs> So I hope I gave you some ideas, I don't know. So there are also so other things that we can demonstrate with disconnected, uh, because at the other end could be not just a client, could be another broker, another messaging system, right? That's occasionally connected and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, thanks for stepping by.